Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Deep Dive into Linux-Based Applications on Microsoft Azure. My name is Jose Miguel Parrela, and I'm an open source product manager with the Azure team. Um, I've been uh, with the Azure team for uh, the last year or so, working with open source at Microsoft for over five years and with Linux for uh, around 15. And today we want to share with you a little bit of uh, where Linux is present in our cloud platform, how applications are being built with Linux in Azure. We're going to look at a couple of demos on features like scale sets and dev test labs. And uh, we can discuss a little bit about what can you do with uh, Linux in uh, Microsoft's uh, cloud platform. We'll have some time for Q&A towards the end of uh, today's webinar. You can uh, use the uh, Q&A window to ask some questions, but uh, we'll uh, respond those uh, towards the end. So with that, uh, let's get started uh, in today's webinar. And again, thanks for joining me. At Microsoft, we have a, uh, a very uh, comprehensive approach to open source in the cloud. That um, approach starts with enabling customers running Linux in their platforms today, as well as uh, multiple open source uh, application platforms and application stacks, but also integrating open source solutions into uh, our offerings. If you think of Azure, Azure HD Insight or Azure Container Service, those are services provided by Microsoft in Azure today in the space of big data and containers that are actually built on Linux and open source solutions. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we're integrating more and more and enabling customers to run uh, these uh, applications in, in our platform, but we're also releasing and contributing to the open source community. So you're gonna see more and more contributions. Just last week, we open sourced PowerShell, making it available on Linux. And that's just one more example of our approach to open source in the cloud. Of course, we do this with partners as well. We know partners are critical in this journey. And we're going to talk about uh, how some of those partnerships uh, are, are panning out in the, in the Linux space and what it means uh, for, for all of you. When it comes to Linux, it's uh, truly been a journey. Uh, if you look at our first contributions, maybe around uh, seven years ago, we, we made a first uh, couple thousand li lines of code contributions to um, uh, the Linux kernel, and then we moved into um, a number of other projects around uh, the, the Linux um, uh, the Linux environment. So uh, when we launched, for example, support for virtual machines in Azure with partnerships like uh, Canonical and Ubuntu, but also in our container strategy, releasing products like uh, .NET uh, Core that's now available on Linux. Visual Studio Code is another good example. Making some of our IP available, like um, SQL Server, for example, that we'll be able to run on Linux as well as in Linux-based containers. And then other partnerships, like our Red Hat partnership uh, right in November 2015, and many other things that are happening in this space truly indicate how, um, how this journey is accelerating rapidly, and we're really happy to have you uh, on board of this journey as well. There's very strong momentum in this journey. I mentioned a couple of the announcements that we had recently, but also I want you to know that uh, there is very strong community momentum around what we're doing with Linux and open source in Azure. We're seeing very strong growth for technologies uh, that are uh, eminently Linux-based like containers. Uh, actually, nearly one in three VMs in Azure today run Linux, and over 40% of all virtual machines that will be created today will run Linux in Azure. So that number will continue growing, and we certainly expect you to continue exploring more and more of this uh, Linux capabilities in Azure after today's webinar. So let's look at where Linux is present in Azure, and that will help me um, frame a little bit the conversation how uh, applications are being built with Linux in Azure. Think of our application platform in Azure, all the things you can do with open source applications in our cloud. You have a choice of uh, architectures. You can work entirely on the infrastructure with virtual machines that you create and manage locally. You can upload the disk, and that's a scenario that uh, many customers use, and it's certainly supported in Azure for Linux customers today. And you can do many other things, right? There are many uh, architectural options here, such as scale sets if you don't want to manage each BHD uh, individually, container service if you're working with containers, batch for those of you uh, uh, creating HPC type applications. And then when we start getting into more the, the path side of the cloud, uh, there are a number of choices as well. Maybe you're more into microservices and a solution like Service Fabric is a good fit. Or you want to run a web application with a language like PHP or, or Node.js and you come to Azure App Service. Or, for example, in the case of um, open source platform as a service, 
you already have something like Cloud Foundry or OpenShift, and you simply want to expand that to uh, the public cloud, well, Azure is an option there as well. Now, you might be asking, where is Linux present in this application platform? We're in all of these options, right? We offer Linux solutions for everything in that circle. Virtual machines and scale sets, container service is actually only available on Linux. Batch for Linux, as well as the open source platform as a service solutions uh, like Cloud Foundry and OpenShift that I already mentioned. So you'll have Linux options for those, of, uh, for those architectural choices, and that's just about the application platform. Let me give you another example. The container portfolio. You can attach an extension to an existing VM to provision Docker. You can use a readily available container-based PaaS platform. You can start from scratch with an uh, Azure Container Service that will give you a choice of orchestrator, and you can go to Marketplace and choose many container partners that we have there as well. The interesting thing about containers is that it also brings a hybrid aspect, and you can uh, move these container workloads across public and private environments, and there are many options uh, to do it. Now, where is Linux present across this container portfolio? Well, inside this area. So all of the solutions that we have in the, in container, uh, in the container space in the public cloud today run Linux. Uh, and then uh, in partnerships that we have, for example, with Mesosphere for DCOS, as well as in the future support that we'll have for Linux and all of the solutions in Azure Stack, you're going to see more and more of uh, Linux support for the container portfolio as well. And one last example is our data platform. We have relational, NoSQL and cache, and big data solutions that you can run on top of existing cloud infrastructure, as well as a platform service. For example, you have uh, a choice of databases like MariaDB, that's MySQL compatible, or Postgres, provided by Binami, that you can just deploy on existing Linux VMs. Uh, there are many uh, options in the community if you want to do things like uh, clustering the MySQL databases and that type of stuff. For NoSQL, you know, from Mongo to Couch, as well as uh, Cassandra, Redis, those are options available in Marketplace today that deploy on Linux. Big data solutions in the Hadoop space that are provided by multiple partners. But if you want to use that as a service, well, we also have many of those, uh, many of those choices. For example, SQL Azure will allow you to connect through many uh, client drivers for things like PHP or Java through our JDBC driver or Linux ODBC driver, and we're working hard to refresh all of those client drivers this year so open source developers can, uh, can certainly have uh, a great experience. When we think of uh, NoSQL and cache, so Azure has a solution called DocumentDB um, that uh, recently included in preview a feature to support the MongoDB protocol natively. So you'll be using Azure Document DB, but you can connect any existing MongoDB application to uh, Document DB through this uh, uh, protocol support. I'm actually going to be showing a short demo on that uh, later today. We also have Redis Cache, and when you think about big data, we have a solution called HD Insight that, as I mentioned, uh, runs on Windows and Linux as well. So if you're asking where Linux is present in this data platform, everything that you see here that runs in the infrastructure can be deployed on a Linux VM. And as I mentioned, HD Insight is available on Linux, uh, too. So this leads me to, to an important point, which is the architectural choices that you have for building Linux applications in Azure. So as we've discussed, you have support for virtual machines, extensions, and extensions on, on top of those virtual machine containers as a use case of those extensions, scale sets, and then all of the third-party um, platform as a service and Azure Container Services that are good examples of what you can build on top of each one of the other tiles here. So customers can, um, will definitely meet customers where they are, whether they want to do more IaaS or more PaaS. Uh, there are many use cases for, for everything inside this spectrum. And what I want to do now is show you uh, a little bit of a stack-based view uh, so you can see how this exactly maps out to what, how an application could be potentially built, and then to what type of things you can, uh, you can uh, connect to add a little bit more value to your existing applications. So if you think of what Azure offers in our uh, hybrid cloud vision uh, at the very basic and fundamental level is the ability to run Linux-based VMs and VM scale sets on top of Azure Stack, that's uh, in technical preview right now, and Azure Public Cloud available today. On top of that, some customers choose to run their own platform as a service solution. There are customers 
uh, that are using Pivotal Cloud Foundry or using OpenShift from Red Hat. And those uh, solutions are supported in Azure and, can, and, and definitely run on top of Linux uh, VMs. Some of them implement containers. Uh, they have their own container orchestration solution there. So for a lot of customers, uh, that's just a, a, a very um, uh, direct way of building applications on top of Linux in Azure. Some other customers need to build some uh, something more specific on top of that, and we offer certainly a number of extensions and capabilities in our platform that let uh, those uh, application developers uh, do what, they, what they're trying to do. Maybe they're trying to start at the container orchestrator level, and they have a choice of, for example, Docker Swarm and Apache Mesos, and on top of that, they're going to deploy container-based applications. Or maybe they're using something like Azure Batch or Service Fabric, as I mentioned, for HPC applications or microservices. Maybe it's an application that leverages more of the media services that are offered in the cloud, or maybe it's an application that is a web, mobile, or uh, serverless uh, type of application where you essentially just focus on the code. And there is certainly support for many open source application stacks, like Node.js being a great example, uh, that you can use pretty much everything that you're seeing on this slide, uh, regardless of what model you choose, more IaaS, more PaaS, et cetera. The question is, how do you extend the application? And I'm going to show you a quick demo that, uh, that's going to uh, use one of the, 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 the block combinations that you see on this slide, that is going to be VM scale sets, and it's going to connect to one of these additional services. What is that additional service? Here are some examples. So after your application is deployed, you can consume many other things that are uh, in, the, in the Azure cloud today that work great with your Linux and open source applications. Many solutions available in Marketplace that can help you expand what you're doing. For example, if you don't want to maintain your own um, Memcache instance or your own Redis instance or your own MongoDB server, uh, you have readily available VMs that can help you do that, uh, as well as many software as a service providers. Microsoft itself provides uh, a number of solutions like Azure SQL Database that I mentioned, DocumentDB, Redis Cache, and HD Insight, Azure Active Directory, which plays nicely with um, all of the web applications that are open source based today uh, through support of many uh, standards like SAML and, and the WS standards, storage for blob storage needs and, and other storage needs, IoT Hub for those of you creating IoT type of applications, um, that, uh, you know, you want to save some time maybe in, in, uh, in solving some problems like how are you going to scale out uh, event streaming or logging or uh, monitoring and, and uh, command and control. For all of those things, Microsoft has created IoT Hub, which plays nicely with the devices and the stacks that you have, as well as application insights to kind of look deeper into your application and let you learn what things are working or not in your, in your application, let you improve that, and that you can use regardless of the block combinations that you take from the bottom right-hand side of this slide. You can be on a VM, you can be an app service, you can be in a container, and this, uh, all of the services will be available uh, to you. Now, what I want to do is um, talk a little bit about scale sets and then show you a, a little demo because scale sets is kind of like in the middle of, of all of this uh, stacks. You know, not everyone wants to do just a single VM because Essentially, you can only scale up, and while you certainly can do auto scale and you can instrument the scalability uh, of your application so you can respond and, and uh, um, you know, increase or decrease as necessary, uh, most applications today are being created or are being refactored into a scale-out type of application uh, model, and uh, in, for those scenarios, Microsoft has uh, created a feature called VM scale sets. So scale customization, availability, low cost and elasticity is all about, uh, it's, it's what scale says is all about. This is something that's supported on Windows and Linux, but quite, quite frankly, I'm going to focus on Linux today because uh, it benefits the most out of this uh, feature in particular. Uh, and again, not every application is ready for scaling out. Uh, that's why it's so important to keep in mind that uh, Microsoft offers a number of services um, uh, in, in, a, in a platform model that you can consume because they can uh, make it easier for you to deploy uh, a scale-out solution. The feature we're going to look at is called Azure VM Scale Sets. Uh, it enables you to deploy and manage VMs as a set. What that means is that you no longer have control of individual properties of the VMs. The platform will control that for you. For example, you don't get to name the VMs because name of a VM no longer means anything. Uh, you essentially will have a resource group and then a scale set inside that resource group 
that will provision uh, the VMs that you need, depending on how you have configured your scale set. Um, it's, um, it's integrated with Azure Autoscale and Load Balancer. So what that means is that you can tell Azure that you want to scale out or scale in, depending on metrics that are observed by the Azure platform, like uh, CPU usage, for example. But you can also instrument it with your own um, uh, monitoring tools. So you can uh, simply make a, a, a REST API call and say, hey, I want more instances or less instances, depending on an event that you can control. And integration with Load Balancer means that uh, the application will continue working regardless of what's happening with the scale set in the, in the back end, you know, whether it's uh, scaling out or in, uh, your application will uh, continue, continue working. Uh, one important thing to mention about, uh, about scale sets is that it benefits from the extension model that we have in Azure. So if you have a, if you want to start from an image like an, an Ubuntu image, for example, but you want to run your own script to provision your application or maybe to let the other members of the scale set know that a new node is coming online, you can do all of that because there is a, a, a rich extension model that, uh, that enables you to do that uh, as well. And that's, uh, that's what we're going to see. So I'm going to uh, uh, go for a live demo now. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, you're going to see, uh, first of all, the, the Azure portal, uh, and, uh, and then we'll switch to a couple other interesting things um, that we can see. So this is the Azure portal. I have a couple of resources created uh, for the two demos that I'm planning to do today. And one is a, a big resource group. This is the box right here uh, that's going to contain the scale set that I want to show you uh, today. To get started, uh, I just want to show you how the template looks like. This is a JSON template running in Visual Studio Code. Um, and it just describes the solution I'm trying to create. To create a scale set, I need a number of things like a virtual network. I'm going to need the load balancer definition, as, as we mentioned, that was uh, integrated into, into scale sets as well. I'm going to need, of course, storage accounts where I'm going to store the disks of, of this um, uh, application nodes. Uh, and I'm going to need some other networking uh, information. For the scale set itself, if you, if you look at this template in particular, what you're going to see that's going to be really interesting is the extension. So as you can see, I have a custom script extension here that is calling a script that I have stored in an Azure Blob uh, storage as well. And it just runs that custom script. And this is what will provision my application inside that VM scale set. This is it. Like, there's really nothing else I need to do here. If you want to visualize this JSON template, there are uh, community tools. Uh, that you can use and just feed this template into the into a website and it will show you a nice visualization of what that will look like. The rest is just the parameters, you know, it's a, a passwords and what exactly images I want to use. One thing I'll call out here is that I'm using an, a Node.js image provided by a partner called Bitnami. So this is a Linux VM that is available in Marketplace. It contains Node.js. So I don't have to worry about installing Node.js and NPM and, and all of those uh, things. All I need to do, and this is all the script does, is actually just clone from a Git repository the application and then proceed to essentially configure the application so it's live. That's all uh, the, the script does. To implement this, you would use uh, the Azure command line tool or the PowerShell tool, but I'm going to use the command line tool from a Linux VM. You would have the two JSON uh, uh, templates that I showed you, the one with the parameters, including passwords, etc and the other one, the bigger one, that has the definition of the solution. You would create a new Azure resource group. That's something simple to do with Azure group, create webinar, and then a location for your, um, for your resource group. And after that resource group is created, you would create a new deployment using the templates that, uh, that I have described. Uh, so for example, you would write Azure help group deployment create, and this will give you all the options you can uh, pass to that uh, to this particular um, to this particular um, a function. Um, so you would say, for example, um, that you want to create a new deployment. That's going to be called deployment one. The group is the webinar that I have just created, the template file, and the parameters file. And this is how you would create uh, uh, an Azure um, a VM scale set using the command line tool. And obviously, this is something you can do um, automatically. You can do through a REST API. You can do from PowerShell. You can do from many, many different tools. So what that will look like, and I have created one um, uh, beforehand, 
it will look like this. What you're looking at is uh, uh, Azure Resource Explorer. is a, is a web application you can use to visualize the templates as they have been deployed, which I think is very valuable because you can certainly um, uh, you can certainly match the templates that you used before deployment with the ones after deployment and see what the platform has uh, you know how the platform has interpreted what you have described. And what you can see here is that the virtual machine scale set has one, and I just created it with one VM. So it has one VM, and I can browse to it. I can, I can look at an instance view, and I can see details of that instance. For example, I can see that it was uh, provisioning succeeded at a particular point in time, uh, but I don't really get to interact with this VM. I just uh, know that the VM was created using the Vietnami Node.js image and that the script was run and that my application is running. How do I know the application is running? Well, I can go to the network resources of this resource group. I see there is a public IP address here, and I see it has a domain name that was assigned by the platform, and I can go to that um, uh, site, and I will see my application here, and as you can see, there is some data already. It's just a simple to-do list application, uh, and you can type something new, and this will be stored. Now, where is this being stored? If you look at the original code, I just took it from a, a GitHub repository. It was using a local MongoDB environment, but I have changed that to point to a DocumentDB interface. So DocumentDB is a managed NoSQL database uh, operated by Microsoft hosted in Azure that provides MongoDB support as a, as a preview. And you simply change this connection string to point to that and the application now uh, kind of has delegated storage to a, uh, to a managed solution, which is what's going to enable me to scale out. How do I scale out? If I go to the scale set, so I'll go back to compute, I'll browse to the uh, virtual machine scale set, and where it says capacity, well, there's a little button that says edit. I can edit that and say, you know what, now I want three, and I can put that request, and this is going to spin up two new VMs, it's going to attach the using the Bitnami image. It's going to attach the extension to it, so it's going to provision the application in each one of those uh, VMs. And because the connection string is actually a, a hosted service, then they will simply come into the rotation. So as soon as I, re I refresh this um, uh, this URL, I'm going to be using any of the three VMs, and I can continue typing down my, my request and uh, uh, filling my to-dos and creating uh, new, new items, and it will work uh, seamlessly. And just like I did scale out, I can do scale in as well, or I can have uh, some external monitoring that, uh, that makes the API call on my behalf. So this is one good example of how VM scale sets uh, are really enabling uh, customers to do something different with applications. And the way it would look like in the portal for a reference, is I see all the resources that were created uh, for, for my uh, VM scale set deployment. So you can see there are a number of storage accounts here. And one interesting thing about scale sets is that I already detect that uh, your patterns. So we know when you're going to scale up, uh, sorry, scale out or scale in. So we can actually do something called over provisioning, where we, uh, we figure out that you probably want to over provision in a, in a period of time. And we already spin up a new VM but we don't charge you for over provisioning, which is very nice. Um, and when you actually make that request, then that, uh, then that uh, additional capacity comes online, which uh, helps you to, um, to, to get more capacity faster. Of course, that's a configurable feature and you can turn it off if you don't want it. So essentially, this is the way it would look like uh, in the portal. Uh, I'll go back to uh, the presentation to talk a little bit more about what you can do with Linux and Azure and then come back for, uh, for another demo. So Burr will meet with me while I switch. All right, so what can you do with uh, Linux images and where do these images come from? Um, so Azure Marketplace is a good, uh, is a good source of uh, Linux solutions that you can deploy in your, um, in your Azure subscription. Uh, about 60% of uh, the images that we have in, the, in Azure Marketplace today are running Linux. Uh, a lot of that is uh, application stacks, full application stacks like uh, WordPress and Drupal. Some of them are databases like MySQL and Postgres. Uh, some are solutions for DevOps like Jenkins and Redmine. Um, and some others are um, uh, more complex uh, solutions like Pivotal Cloud Foundry or DCOS and so on. 
Uh, so that's one big source. And uh, there's a category within uh, those images that's called the endorsed distributions. And for those of you that have been uh, Linux users in Azure, uh, you know what an endorsed distribution is, but I'll, I'll explain it in just a second. Um, the other big source for Linux images in Azure is the custom BHDs. So these are customers that bring their own disks from a platform, can be Hyper-V, can be KVM, can be Beamware, uh, or create their own BHDs using a tool like Packer. So Packer is a tool from HashiCorp, it's an open source tool, where developers essentially describe their application in code form, and it creates a BHD, uh, and in the case of Packer, it, it has the ability to create the VHD in Azure, so you don't really have to even upload the VHD, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a, a cool feature. Uh, there is full support for uh, the Azure resource management model in tools like Packer, and we have customers, especially uh, customers that have very strong DevOps, DevOps practices that are using uh, this purpose-built applications. Now, back to endorsed distributions. Uh, you see some of the logos of our endorsed distributions, including Red Hat Enterprise Linux, as well as Ubuntu, SUSE, uh, Oracle Linux, and others. Um, it's it's important to understand that um, what when we mean when we say when we say in, endorsed distros is uh, we have partnerships established that help us do more with those images in our platform. So you know you're going to have a local repository. You know we're going to have a relationship with a partner that's going to help, uh, for example, respond to things like Heartbleed or Shellshock uh, and, and uh, security type of uh, uh, situations where we need to do uh, something together to make sure that we respond to our customers. Now, obviously, we have uh, premium images uh, that uh, offer 24-7 support. Uh, Microsoft is, is the one that manages the support case, so there's uh, only one point of contact, but we'll handle the backend work with the appropriate partner. Uh, and those uh, premium images are available today for Red Hat Enterprise Linux as well as SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. So that's one example of um, of what, uh, you know the, the applications, the, um, the images that you can use to build your applications in Azure. Now the reason why I'm bringing that up is because um, there are specific partnerships that I think could be uh, interesting from an application platform standpoint. One good example is Red Hat. We started our, our, our partnership with Red Hat in the cloud in November 2015, and we made available uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux images in Azure Marketplace in February this year. Uh, and you know, we start from the from the foundation of choice. We want to make sure you have choice for your applications. And and in this Enterprise Cloud Alliance, we're making available four big product families: OpenShift, Gluster, CloudForms, and Javas that you can use to build applications, whether using your existing application portfolio and the skills and stacks you already use, or bringing the Microsoft portfolio to your platform. So we have already announced SQL Server will run on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We have announced .NET Core runs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and Operations Management Suite can monitor uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So whether you, again, use your application portfolio, use the Microsoft portfolio, you can run it on top of the Red Hat uh, family of products, and all of that can run in Azure as well. Uh, that's one good example of how uh, specific applications are built. A lot of customers um, are, are looking at the public cloud for uh, a solution space that we generally call dev test. So for development and testing, one of the popular features of Azure is the marketplace and the ability to pick any application stack uh, that uh, partners like Vietnami offer in Azure Marketplace to accelerate development. Just Vietnami offers over 120 open source stacks today. I've mentioned some of them, uh, especially the ones in the DevOps space like Redmine, uh, but there are many applications in document management, content management, etc., that are really popular with customers. Um, now, having the image available is just one piece of the puzzle. When you think about dev test, there are many reasons why the public cloud is in consideration, but also there are many challenges. So while the public cloud offers agility, economics, scale, and speed, the concerns come more from the side of integration, security, compliance, and performance. And I think uh, you, know, you probably relate to the problem of uh, developers asking for more and more of these images, and you know, whether it's container images or VM images or something else, um, and, and obviously all of the uh, enterprise uh, considerations of how do we meter this, how do we charge back, how do we control with some sort of policies, et cetera, are, are definitely important considerations. 
Uh, to go a little bit deeper on that, we can share that uh, there, there are certainly challenges our customers are seeing with running uh, development and testing on premises. There are many tools that let developers do magic in their own laptops or in development servers on premises. But ultimately, there are going to there are going to be many challenges uh, when those applications need to move to production. Uh, eventually, it's not economic, and also it's very uh, complicated to manage. Uh, we partner with many organizations that are, uh, you know, feeding us more and more of this information. We certainly relate with that, and that's why a lot of our partners are starting to look to connect to the public cloud natively um, and and circumventing, if you will, a little bit of the uh, of the desktop experience of it. To give you again one good example. If a developer is writing a, a short piece of text that describes the application the way they want it, there's no need really to build that BHD locally in a local developer computer if ultimately the application will be deployed uh, and even tested in, in the cloud. So that's why the applications that can bring infrastructure as code to life uh, are targeting Azure directly so we can uh, help uh, IT uh, be be more effective with uh, with the whole dev test um, uh, challenge. We have a solution in Azure called Dev Test Labs that addresses many of the uh, of the scenarios that I have uh, that I have described today. It's a fast and easy way to have dev test environments in Azure. Uh, you can share it with your team. The team doesn't they don't need to be uh, you know subscription administrators. They don't need to know what is happening with the rest of the Azure subscription of an organization. And more importantly, it's on demand, and it implements policy so IT can lean back uh, and, and let developers um, uh, use the, the public cloud for development and testing needs with, uh, with a certain amount of control, of control, but especially with agility as well. So I wanted to show you a little bit of that, uh, how that experience uh, looks like for Linux uh, developers. So what I'll do is uh, share my screen again. And I'm going to be in the Azure portal, and uh, this is the the webinar um, resource group that uh, we were looking at for the scale set in uh, just a few minutes ago. The other resource I have here in my dashboard is um, it's a, it's a dev test lab. So this dev test lab, as you can see, the uh, visually it's quite different. I have some different options than compared to my scale set. For example, I have a new concept here called formulas. And so these formulas are ex essentially recipes to create the dev test experience that IT wants to package for the developers. You know, developers also don't want to have a base Linux image and then have to run a bunch of scripts to bring the image up to uh, whatever standard they have to actually go and bring the artifacts to build the application. They really just want to automate that part and, if possible, to have some sort of version control of that part. So we offer that in, in formulas. So I have created a formula uh, ahead of time but um, but I'll create a new one just uh, just uh, to go through it. So um, you can choose a base for your formula. Obviously, there's got to be a starting point, um, and you can pick from a, a number of options here. But uh, in my case, I'll just go and search for an Ubuntu image. I'm taking Ubuntu 14.04. I define a name for it. Let's call it Webinar Nginx. Um, and then you describe a username for every single uh, VM that will be created in this lab will use this username and it can be changed later, but it's the one starting point so you don't have to uh, you know, manage particular credentials for people. Uh, I have previously stored a password in a, a, a little repository that uh, my lab has so I can uh, manage credentials and that type of stuff, retire a password if I don't, if I don't want to use it anymore. Uh, you can define the size for the virtual machine and then you have a section here called artifacts. So the artifacts section is what's interesting because you have a number of options here to essentially bring the image up to speed. And again, this is a Linux image. So it already knows that and showing me some options for that Linux image, like installing packages using apt on Debian and Ubuntu, or running a Chef client, or deploying a particular container, a Docker container, or install a Node.js package. Here are just some of the options that we have. I'm going to choose the first one, app get. I want to make sure a number of packages are pre-installed in this VM uh, in time for the developer to just log in and start building the application, whatever that application is. So I have a little bit of a cheat sheet here because it's a, it's a big list. So I have a, a little bit over 10 packages that I'm just passing as a string here, uh, separated by spaces, and these are the packages that I want. I can pass some other options, but that's all that I need. 
So I can just hit add. As you can see, there's one artifact selected. I can add more because the formula can be more complicated than that. I can just hit OK and then create, and I will create a new formula based on this recipe that I have described. Obviously, you could have started with your own BHD image. Maybe you already had a golden image. You can use that too. There, there's going to be pros and cons for both models. You can complement uh, golden images with formulas as well. In this case, I'm just using a stock Ubuntu image and, and some other uh, information to actually create that VM. So now what will happen is I will invite users to this lab. And these users don't have to be subscription administrators. I can just go to configuration and I'll find users and I can create new users that are going to be uh, dead test lab users. And those users, they just have to live in my directory. Uh, but you know, they can be an, an Outlook.com type of uh, uh, user. They don't even have to be part of the Azure subscription. So as you can see, there are many roles, and I can delegate the entire lab to someone else if, uh, you know, if, for example, I have more complex team organizations, we can do that as well. So after you invite people, they will be able to deploy VMs, but just using the formulas and the policies that you have defined. So for example, I have a couple of VMs running here, and these VMs already are policy aware. So this is essentially saying it's going to shut down this VM at 7 p.m. every day because it assumes I'm not going to use it at, at, at that time. And then I could control if I want uh, uh, users to opt in or opt out of those policies. And there are many other policies I can actually uh, apply as well, like what type of VM sizes I want to allow or what type of images I want to allow, which is very important, especially in the Linux world, uh, because as we have seen, 60% of marketplaces Linux VMs, and there are many solutions that are available as open source, and you probably want to control that as well. Uh, so when you create a new virtual machine, uh, in this case, when you choose a base, you no longer have to choose Ubuntu. Now you can choose Webinar Nginx, and that's going to be Ubuntu plus all the other information that I have, uh, that I have described. And so the process of creating that VM is going to be much more streamlined. Now after you do that, you're going to end up with a VM like this one that I have previously created. And all the software for building my application is already here. So all I need to do is get my file. And you're probably asking yourself, why are you running the commands? I could have attached a VM extension, right? And just run a, um, and just run a, a script like I did for the scale set. And that's a completely valid uh, choice of, as well. So essentially what I'm doing now is just building the Nginx package, and this is because of that test lab previously installed all the packages that I needed on this Ubuntu VM for me to uh, build that application. So that's uh, that's how a that test lab uh, looks like when you are using Linux applications, and that's another uh, good resource you can use uh, moving forward. I'll stop my screen share now, and I'll go back to uh, the slides to um, share with you a little bit more about other types of applications and tools that we support in Azure for uh, creating these Linux-based apps. It's not only about the platform, it's not only about the operating system, uh, the partnerships are very important, but it's not just about that. It's about adding value to your existing investments, whether you already have tools in spaces like configuration management and infrastructure as code or service modeling and orchestration, monitoring and management, or past platforms. We support many of those solutions in Azure today. Um, and uh, we, we work hard to ensure that there's feature parity in a number of fronts, uh, like Azure Resource Management is one of the important things that we're enabling for all of our customers, because we certainly want to make sure that if you're going to write templates and you're going to write tools, you know that those tools can target Azure in Azure Stack. You know that the extensions are going to be there to make, uh, to make life easier for application developers and architects. Uh, and so certainly um, any of these tools that you're using with support in Azure today, uh, for example, Jenkins is a demo I'm not going to run through today, but you can actually um, create a, a, a workflow, a DevOps workflow that spins up VMs for you in Azure, Linux VMs, moves the artifacts there, builds the artifacts and tests, and then uh, it's ephemeral type of VMs, and we charge you by the minute. So it's really ephemeral compute that you, that you, that you have only uh, for the purpose of, uh, of your DevOps workflow, and it's a scenario we support in uh, in, the, um, in Azure today. There are many customers using Linux and open source in Azure. Um, as, as I said earlier, nearly one in three VMs that run in Azure uh, are running Linux. And there are many uh, 
customers that are using it for development and testing or HPC application, uh, customers using Ubuntu and Red Hat and SUSE and many others. I actually wanted to share with you, if you want to learn more about those customers, uh, customers at Microsoft.com is a great site. I want to share with you something that's, um, that's quite interesting. It's the uh, Peruvian uh, elections office. Uh, there recently was a, a big election. And they used Linux in Azure to essentially reduce absentee voters. So uh, that was a, a pretty cool way of leveraging the public cloud. They used SUSE uh, in a PHP and MySQL based application to essentially help people find their uh, the voting uh, voting uh, polling booth uh, uh, faster. And uh, that uh, turned out in a 59% decrease in uh, uh, people that abstain from voting in presidential elections, which is kind of kind of a big deal. Um, so it's one good example of uh, Linux, uh, Linux-powered applications in the public cloud uh, that is uh, quite recent, and I thought it was uh, it was good to share uh, with all of you. I have a couple of things I want to uh, uh, share with you today that I think are, are going to be useful moving forward, uh, and we're going to have some time for questions and answers towards the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, this is the first in a, in a series of webinars. I'm going to share with you a little bit de uh, details on the calendar. Uh, there, we, we're going to have deep open source conversations on a number of scenarios. This is just an introduction to Linux-based applications, uh, and I think that uh, we're going to go deeper and deeper into into partner-specific and product-specific and solution-specific open source solutions. Uh, in the uh, Microsoft Technology Centers, we have uh, strategy briefings that are available for you to, uh, to schedule, sign up, and, uh, and attend. Uh, you and your teams are welcome. We have a very, a very strong open source uh, um, uh, muscle that we're developing, the MTCs. Uh, trial uh, is, uh, is uh, of course available. It includes uh, many Linux solutions. Not everything that we have in Azure Marketplace can be uh, run the trial because we obviously have very complex and large solutions that require many VMs and resources, but you can certainly get started with Linux uh, development and testing, for example, in the trial account. And uh, if you want to learn more about our uh, support for Linux solutions, just go to azure.com slash Linux. Uh, that's a site we're launching recently and uh, it has some uh, interesting information for, for all of you. As I said, the MTCs have a number of uh, open source capabilities they can share with you and your teams. Uh, such as uh, Linux management with a uh, focus on Red Hat, number of uh, big data and analytics solutions, as well as uh, modern application development and DevOps using open source tools. All of the Azure SDKs are open source. Our API is actually presented as a spec, and this spec changes with the API. Uh, and based on that spec, we create, we generate all the SDKs automatically. So. Uh, the product is called AutoRest, and, and essentially it enables, enables us to have feature parity by design in the SDKs, and that is what uh, it's really bringing uh, modern application development to a whole uh, different level. If you want to sign up for, for one of these uh, briefings, please visit uh, aka.ms slash test dash Azure. Uh, you're going to have these um, uh, links as well available to you. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a number of other webinars we're, uh, we're running. Uh, today is the first one. But uh, if you're interested in DevOps, and particularly CI, CD, uh, there's a, there's a, a Jenkins-focused webinar coming up. Uh, then we're going to have high availability uh, as well as uh, NoSQL with our partners, Bitnami. Uh, and then um, in November, we have a Cloudera webinar uh, specifically for those of you that are looking at big data uh, solutions in Azure based on Linux systems. As I mentioned, trial is uh, one of the things that's available uh, as well, and uh, there is support for Linux there too. And uh, what I wanted to do now is uh, uh, open it up for Q&A. I'm looking at uh, the Q&A window, and I've seen a couple uh, and a couple things coming through. Um, so the first question I wanted to to um, uh, to address before making a few announcements is uh, is actually a question on uh, does Azure have a similar service like Amazon EVS? Uh, we have Azure Disks and those disks are standards um, and premium. Um, currently, we have another solution that we're adding to that um, uh, portfolio that is called Managed Disks. This feature is currently in private preview. It will be generally available early next year. There is an Ignite session that will go deep into this feature, Managed Disks, so I, uh, I, I certainly invite you to uh, take a look at that. Uh, the session is entitled I'm um, looking it up quickly. It's called Optimize ISBM Storage Using Azure Disks and Files, uh, and uh, certainly something interesting to uh, um, to check out. 
I think that uh, there was a follow-up question on that. Can you attach this feature to Azure CDN? I think we'll uh, we'll take that offline because uh, I'm not sure if the if the the disk feature is uh, connected to CDN. But that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, so I'll mark this as answered. Uh, there was another question here. Will we be able to use PowerShell to access Docker on the Linux platform? Um, our, when we so the Docker API, we expect customers will use the Docker tools, the native tools, right? Like the Docker CLI, and then tools like Docker uh, Machine or Docker Compose. Those are the tools you're going to use to manage Docker containers in Azure. Uh, with PowerShell, you have Azure support. So PowerShell on Linux also brings the Azure commandlet, so you can manage Azure from PowerShell on Linux. Uh, I do want to maybe make a, a brief comment here. I know a lot of customers are, and system administrators are really excited about uh, the PowerShell announcement, and there's been a lot of questions uh, over the last few days. Um, if you already have a sysadmin team that is invested on Bash and tools, management tools on, on, on Linux, by all means, continue using that. What the value that PowerShell is bringing to the table is the ability to manage the Windows VMs programmatically from your Linux system. So your scripts, your cron jobs, your automations, your uh, uh, backup tasks that previously maybe needed to rely on a, on a different process and timing of a different process on a Windows system, or even worse, RDP into a system and then it having to interface with some GUI. Now you can use PowerShell to do that. So I think that's a, that's a great area of value for, um, for potential uh, PowerShell users as well. I, um, I'll take a few more questions and uh, please stay by, uh, please stay in the, in the line because I have a, another announcement that I wanted to make uh, and, and feel free to continue asking questions as, as necessary. Can VM scale sets be configured uh, with logic monitor monitoring tool to increase decrease VMs as long as the tool can call a REST API through some sort of web hooks, et cetera, it can be integrated. I know of a number of integrations already, um, like you know the standard Slack, pager duty, et cetera. Um, but certainly scale sets, you can make the call to scale it up or uh, scale it out or scale it in as necessary with just a REST API call. What I did on the browser was just a REST API call. I, I used my browser and this tool, but you could have done it through curl, uh, just passing your, your credentials and, and making that call. Thanks for the question. I think the integration is, uh, is really important. Uh, polish settings files to use the marketplace. The, uh, the Azure command line tool uh, requires, requires you to have the published settings file uh, in, your, in your profile where you're running Windows, Linux, or Mac uh, to essentially uh, um, uh, share credentials. Some, uh, in some models, uh, some login models have changed recently. If you're using multi-factor multi authentication, for example, you'll have to Azure login first, uh, run through the multi-factor authentication, and then you'll have a token uh, that may or may not, depending on the version of the CLI you're using, may or may not be stored in that published settings file. Um, the marketplace items also you require to you're required to uh, uh, authorize programmatic deployment. You know we certainly don't want someone creating a script that um, for whatever reason deploys a, a big data solution that is uh, you know inadvertently uh, left running for for too long. So uh, we also want people to opt in for what images in the Azure marketplace you want to, um, you want to, you want to deploy uh, programmatically as well. Another question is, uh, are Docker images and containers related to the images and formulas you showed in the demo, or are they completely different things? Uh, for the demo, they're not related, but they could be related if you decide to deploy the application in Docker containers. For example, instead of cloning the, from GitHub the, the code of the application that I showed, and then making changes to it, et cetera, I could have just posted a Docker image file to the Docker Hub uh, and essentially just tell the formula, you know, instead of running all of this and then uh, running these commands, et cetera, just deploy this image from Docker, and that could have been another, another path uh, as well. Uh, it would have made my life a little bit more complicated in terms of the networking, et cetera. By running the application in the host, it's easier for me uh, to do the demo because of the networking. But it's certainly viable, and it is. That's it. That's why the artifact, uh, the artifacts uh, contain uh, Docker support as well. Uh, network structure like VLAN and other scaling is defined here. Great question. Uh, so this all lives in a subnet, and uh, uh, I no longer have control of names of VMs, and I no longer have control of network IP addresses of VMs. So there's just a subnet, there's a DHCP server that assigns, uh, that assigns uh, IP addresses in that uh, scale set, and there is a load balancer pool. 
So load balancer pool will be informed that an UVM is coming into the rotation or getting out. Uh, it will prove the endpoint, and I can have rules for that, of course, and then it will add it to the load balancer. So the load balancer in this demo is managed by, by Azure, uh, and, and so is the entire subnet, et cetera, and the public IP address is assigned to a load balancer. I could have done many other models. I could have deployed a jump box and then a scale set and connect them through a, through a virtual network. I could have done many other models, but, uh, but that's the one that I, used, uh, that I use now. I want to make sure that uh, you take a, a moment and complete our, our survey. Uh, it's located at the bottom of your, of your screen. If you can't view it, you might need to refresh your browser. So feedback is really, really important. I appreciate all the questions, so make sure that uh, you also take the, take the time to complete the survey. Um, I have a, another question on uh, configuration of VPN to the structure. Yes, so the virtual network can eventually be attached to uh, one of the VPN options that we have in Azure, uh, including things like Express Route. Uh, it can also span not just VMs. So you can have an app service web application that is connected to the same virtual network. This is actually quite popular for LAMP-based applications. For example, you're running a PHP application on Azure App Service. Um, it's a standard PHP application. Uh, it, it will run on Windows because App Service, App Service runs on Windows, even though it has great PHP support. Um, and, and that's fine, but when you start running the MySQL part of it, uh, you definitely want to run it in, in your own VMs, so you just connect them. You don't want to, you know, you don't want the traffic to to leak out to the internet. So you essentially connect them through a virtual network. So you can certainly do that, um, uh, do that as well. Uh, some customers need to connect to a device that is not supported by by Azure VPN today. So sometimes they deploy their own VPN solutions, for example, OpenVPN or OpenSwan or something like that. Uh, that's that's also a, uh, a something you can do uh, as well, but your networking configuration will be a little bit more uh, complicated. All right, I uh, I think I've uh, I've gotten uh, most of the questions. I really appreciate uh, your time today. If there's any final questions, um, it's a uh, it's a good time now. Again, I want to make sure I um, I uh, reiterate that it's uh, important for for us that you fill out the survey. Uh, it's located at the bottom of the screen, and uh, you might need to refresh your browser if uh, it doesn't show up. Um, uh, there is one last question that I wanted to address. It, uh, it says, can we add local storage, or we need to depend only on cloud storage? Uh, that's, that's a more uh, sophisticated scenario. Uh, all of these scale set solutions assume that you're using cloud storage, so blob storage in the case of Azure, uh, of Azure storage. Uh, Microsoft does have solutions for hybrid, hybrid storage. Uh, how they would be connected to the scale set, it probably will need more work. Uh, so right now the solutions are, are uh, created for, for cloud sto uh, storage primarily. I appreciate the question. Uh, and again, we, we appreciate the feedback as well. I, uh, there, the engineering team through feedback.azure.com as well as the, the Azure blog and many other uh, places is uh, actively looking for feedback from Linux and, and open source customers. I really appreciate your time today. I think it's an exciting time to build Linux applications in the cloud, particularly in Microsoft Azure. We want to make sure it is a first-class experience for all of you. And uh, I am I'm glad that you joined us today to have a, a brief conversation and a couple demos on some of the capabilities that are built into a platform today. Really appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining this webinar.